next year he's going to be in Sheffield. Uh, so we're this this project is at some point a paper will come out on this, but it's not finished yet. Oh, and he's watching online as well. Uh, okay, so uh, what's the sort of what's the sort of aim of this whole story? Uh, the aim is to develop a lattice theory uh, for, let's say, type two degenerations, and I'll just tell you what all these things are uh, of K threes. That's, uh, shall we say, natural for doing mirror symmetry. And I'm not going to say an awful lot about mirror symmetry, partly for reasons of time and partly because that's part of the in progress. Uh, but I'm going to say a lot about the, uh, the lattice theory stuff. So uh, the first part is um, some stuff on pseudo lattices. And this is mostly background, but they're not sort of common objects. Uh, if you're after some references, uh, this was really sort of introduced by Kuznetsov based on work of a bunch of earlier people. In a paper of 2017, that paper is called Exceptional Collections for something, something, something. But 2017 Exceptional Collections is enough. And a paper that I wrote with Andrew Harder in 2020, which was called, I don't remember, probably has pseudolatis in the title. Um, the unique paper written by Andrew and I in 2020. Okay, so what is a pseudolattice? A pseudolattice is, and I'm going to sort of abbreviate to PL, that's pseudolattice, not piecewise linear. Uh, G. It's a finitely generated abelian group, uh, finitely generated free abelian group. Uh, and I'm going to equip it with a pairing, a non degenerate bilinear form. Uh, it's an integral bilinear form mapping from. Uh, G cross G into Z. Uh, and the important thing with this, you know, like what's the difference between this and a lattice? The important thing with this is uh, we do not assume symmetric. Okay, so this thing could be, you know, it could be a, a more complicated bilinear form, not necessarily a symmetric bilinear form. Um, okay, so I'm not going to spend an enormous amount of time going over sort of background theory. I'm mostly just going to give you a sort of example and say, you know, point out some of the basic definitions in this. So here is the, the running example for the first part of the talk. Uh, let's say that X is a non-rational, a non-singular rational surface. I only work over C. I'm not smart enough to do other fields. Uh, so X is a non-singular rational surface. I'm going to assume that the anti-canonical linear system of X uh, contains a smooth member. So this contains all of the del Pezzo surfaces, but it's also much bigger. I don't assume any positivity. I just assume that there's some smoothness. Um, so what we can do, we can build a pseudo lattice G, and this is uh, the numerical growth and deep group of uh, the bounded derived category, well, we've got to get my notation right. The bounded derived category of coherent sheaves on X. And we can equip this with the Euler pairing. The Euler pairing is given by, if I've got two classes of sheaves, F1 and F2, this is the sum of minus one to the I uh, hom from F1 to F2 twisted by I, or shifted by I. So the shift by I means that this thing is not going to be a symmetric bilinear form. Uh, so this is going to be a pseudo lattice. Now, uh, you know, these things are quite general in general. So we're going to have, I'm going to let P be the class of the structure sheaf of a point. This is what's called. So if I'm looking at pseudo lattices in general, this is what's called a point like vector. And the reason it's called a point like vector is because it looks like a structure sheet of a point. There's a set of conditions. You can define these things purely algebraically. There's a set of conditions that tell you what point like vectors are. I'm not going to go through all of that. You can read in Kuznetsov, but you know, these are abstractly, these are things living inside a pseudo lattice that behave like the structure sheet of a point behaves. 
if you're living in this numerical growth industry. Uh, there's some more things here. So if I take the orthogonal complement of P, the quotient by P, if I'm working in here, what does that give me? That gives me the neuron severity group of X. And so I call that the neuron severity group of G. Again, if I've got just an abstract pseudo lattice along with a point like vector, I can do P per divided by P. Part of the condition, part of the definition of point like vectors says that this thing is going to be well defined. Um, this thing is actually a lattice. So the restriction of the bilinear form to this neuron to vary, part of the definition of the point like vector is that the restriction of the bilinear form to this thing becomes symmetric. So this is actually like a, a, a proper lattice and not a pseudo lattice. Uh, I can also define uh, KG. Again, this can be defined purely algebraically in terms of the pseudo lattices, but we can think of it as the class of the canonical bundle of X, and this is called the canon uh, canonical class uh, of G. So these are things we do. We can also, uh, we can define a SARE operator. So the SARE operator on this category is given by tensor by O of X and then shift by N. This is the SARE operator. It's got the following property. The following property is, if I take a pair of things, uh, V and U, I can sort of commute them if I use the SARE operator. All fairly standard stuff so far, hopefully. But you know, all of this can be done purely algebraically without resorting to talking about the, um, without resorting to a specific example. Uh, okay, right. So, what can I do? Let's say uh, if I've got C in the anti-canonical linear system, let's say this is a smooth curve. Um, so then I can take uh, I to be the embedding of C into X. And what I can do is I can, I can take the pullback, the pullback by I, this is a map from G to the new, numerical growth and deep group of the derived, uh, all this stuff and the derived category of coherent sheaves on C. So C is going to be a smooth elliptic curve just by a junction. Uh, so this is what we call a spherical homomorphism. Uh, it's an example of, again, this is something you can define completely abstractly for pseudo lattices, but I'm not going to do so. Uh, Part of the definition of that is that it has to have what's called a right adjoint. So the right adjoint in this case is by lower star and the defining property of that is that if I do I upper star of U with V, that's, that gives me the same, I mean, this is just gives me an integer, right? That's the same as doing U with I lower star of V. So, we can sort of pull classes up and push classes down and that respects the bilinear forms. Um, so everything works in this nice example, but we can also, you know, the sort of the thing I want to get across somehow is that we can also do all of this just purely algebraically in terms of abstract structures, pseudo lattices, bilinear forms, this kind of thing. Okay, uh, and I will say, uh, I'm going to get even more vague we're going to get back to being specific in a minute. A spherical homomorphism, let's say F from G to E. E is isomorphic to uh, this thing of an elliptic curve. Brackets. Uh, so a spherical homomorphism from a pseudo lattice to the bounded, the numerical growth and group of the bounded derived category of coherent sheaves on elliptic curve. Uh, this thing is called quasi del pezzo. Quasi del pezzo. If it looks like this thing, I upper star in this example. So again, this is something that you know one can make a purely algebraic definition of in terms of the pseudo lattices, but you know, to give a talk where I give all these definitions, I would spend an hour and not get through the definition. So 
Uh, I'm just kind of saying, I'm giving you an example and saying all of this can be generalized purely out of it. Okay, we're all happy. The given value of happy. Okay, so right now we're going to get into the, uh, well, we're getting, we're getting closer to the meat. So let's suppose I've got F from G to E and uh, G from G to E. These are two spherical homomorphisms. Uh, I can use this. I can put a pseudo lattice structure on uh, the direct sum G direct sum H. And how do I do it? Uh, I do sort of my, my bilinear form is given by block diagonal stuff. So I've got, if I've got two things U and V, what do I, what am I meaning here? If I've got two elements U and V that are both in G, I take the intersection in G. If I've got two elements U and V in H, I take the intersection in H. I take zero down there. And if I'm up here, I take F of U with G of V inside E. So this is, this is what to do if I get something where one of them is in G and one is in H. Then this is extended by linear. Uh, so we call this uh, F semi-direct sum G mapping from uh, get the notation right G dem semi-direct sum H to E. Okay, so this is you can prove this is also a uh, this is also a spherical homomorphism. You can prove that you know certain properties of this can be deduced from certain properties of the factors. So in particular, things like, um, you know, this curve C being anti-canonical is something that, you know, gives you certain properties. Again, I don't want to go too far into details. Okay, now I have to figure out how to clean the board. What's the least professional example of this you're ever going to see? If I do it without getting myself covered in filthy chalk water, I'm going to be uh, happy. That's the bare minimum. Oh, look, I missed a bit in the middle. Now for the hard bit. Hey, this is not too disgusting. Don't shake it, that's how you get it all over. Uh, okay, right. So, so now, you, you know, what's the main kind of construction here? Uh, let's say I've got Fi from Gi to E. These are quasi del pezzo spherical homs of pseudo lattices. My line down the middle. Uh, I'm going to make an assumption. I'm going to assume, remember, I had these canonical classes. I'm going to assume that the K of G1 intersected with itself is the same as the negative of K of G2 intersected with itself. And we'll sort of, I'll talk about where this condition comes from in a moment when I give you an example of where this stuff comes up. Uh, and then what I can define is I can define F to be the semi-direct sum of F1 with minus F2. Uh, this thing works out to be a spherical homomorphism. I'm going to let R be its right adjoint. F. And then we have the following lemma. And this is a purely, purely a statement about pseudo lattice. This does not use any of the geometry here. It's just a purely sort of algebraic statement. So, uh, let K be the kernel of F. Uh, and E bar be the saturation of uh, R of E inside uh, R of E, R of E inside G. Then the following is true. Uh, the bilinear form is symmetric on K. in the form of symmetric on K. And uh, E bar as a subset of K is totally degenerate. 
So what do we do if we've got a totally degenerate sublet of a lattice? We can quotient it. So what I can then do is I can write down an exact sequence. Uh, zero goes to E bar, goes to K, goes to K mod E bar, goes to zero. Well, I can call that thing M. Okay. That's the kind of algebraic background. Now I'm going to show where this comes up in John. Right, so everything I've said so far, I sort of, you know, I've waved my hands an awful lot. But, you know, the takeaway message is we can do these things called pseudo lattices. They can have various properties we don't care too much about. If they're sort of particularly nice, we can glue them in pairs. And when we glue them in pairs, we get this set of properties. So we get, we take the kernel of this, this gluing map, and we take the saturation of the right adjoint, and we get this. Okay, so where is this gonna, where is this gonna show up? Uh, let's look at Turing degenerations of K-twins. We're in the generations of k -tons. So I'm going to take uh, curly V over a complex disk. This is going to be some degeneration. In here, I've got a point zero. Over that, I'm going to have V zero. Uh, I'm also going to have V, and that's just going to be over some sort of generic point uh, T. I'm going to assume this is what's called a Turing degeneration. So what's this going to be? It's going to be V naught is going to be a union. Have I got my notation right? If I don't get the notation right, it's a C. So this is a degeneration. I'm degenerating my K3 surfaces. I'm taking a very special type of degeneration. I'm degenerating them to unions of two surfaces glued along a curve C. So my degeneration looks something like, looks something like this. Uh, so x1 and x2 are rational and c is smooth anti-canonical um yeah c is smooth anti-canonical uh so somehow you know these things there's old results of friedman somehow these things could be sort of thought of as primitive type 2 degenerations of paper you can sort of think of these things as like minimal type two degenerations of K3 surfaces. Other, degen other type two degenerations can, to some extent, be obtained from these by base change. Uh, do I want to say anything else now? Probably. Actually, let's put some more on here before I erase things. So as we saw before, I can let, I can let GIs be these things. I can let the FIs be the map from GI to you know this thing, K naught num, BB co of C. And you know, everything is I'm in the setting that I was in before, right? You know, I've got these things are quasi del petro pseudo lattices. I've got a pair of them, I've got these maps. So what am I going to do? The semi-stability gives me this condition that the intersection of the canonical devices on one has to be negative the intersection of the canonical devices on the other. This is condition on such a degeneration for it to be smoothable. Uh, so, so we should in theory, well, the idea is we will see uh, these pseudo lattices showing up kind of naturally in the situation of these degenerations, getting better at this thing. Okay. So here is the next lemma. Uh, so over Q, what do I get if I take this pseudo lattice G tensored with Q? So what was G? G was defined just exactly as. Uh, oh, I didn't tell you what G is. This is this is the gluing of these along F1 direct sum minus F2. Uh, so it's that over Q. This is isomorphic by the churn character map to the even cohomology of X1 direct sum even cohomology of X2, uh, where this is Q cohomology. 
And moreover, KQ by the same thing is isomorphic to uh, H naught of V naught, direct sum, the second weight graded piece of H2 of V naught, uh, direct sum, uh, H4 of V naught. So somehow this is the middle graded piece. I mean, these ones, the mixed hodge structures are not interesting. I mean, they're pure on the top and the bottom. So this is the middle weight graded piece of the mixed hodge structure on the cohomology of the central fiber. So what have we achieved here? What we've achieved here is we've achieved in a sort of natural way coming from the lattice theory of the two components, we've achieved the lattice theory on the an appropriate graded piece of the cohomology of the central fiber of the degeneration. Um, so we've got that, then we can look, we've got this exact sequence. Can we identify what that is? Those of you who study degenerations and mixed host structures probably know where I'm going already. So M, this quotient up here is isomorphic to uh, the limiting mixed host structure of H naught, uh, second weight graded piece, limiting mixed hot structure, and H4 lim. Yes. K mod E bar is this thing. This is K mod E bar. Wait for the next statement. <laughs> Uh, so now I haven't missed a cue here. This is a legitimate isomorphism over Z. There's actually a Z isomorphism between these two things. So over here, we've got the cues. For this one, we do not need the cues. So what does this give us overall? Uh, I can take my exact sequence tensor it over Q, and this is going to give me zero goes to, I get two classes here, Q eta and Q xi. I'll tell you what those are in a second. Uh, this goes to H naught, V naught, direct sum, you know, the thing that's K, and this goes to H naught, lim, V, direct sum, blah, 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 goes to zero. What is this? We all recognize this sequence. This is Clement Schmidt. So this is the Clement Schmidt exact sequence. And what we've done is we've endowed it with a lattice theory from these coming from these super lattices. Uh, Yeah, maybe, maybe I need like just second weight graded piece. It's just second weight piece rather than second weight graded piece. Let's let me check it afterwards. I've got a set of notes, and maybe there's maybe there's maybe this is not exactly. It's something very much like. It's some weight graded. It's some weight piece in the uh, in the Clement Schmidt. But I need I'll need to check my my notes that aren't these ones because it's a sort of technical. Uh, I can tell you what Zion Eta are. Uh, Xi is the class of minus C, C in uh, H2X1, direct sum H2X2, and eta is the class of minus a point, a point in H4 of X1, direct sum H4 of X2. Uh, so these are sort of very nice identifiable things. Um, now there's results of, uh, so you can ask like, okay, I've got these cues here. The cues are not really ideal. This isomorphism over Z, what goes wrong? Uh, there's results of Friedman from 1984 that say that actually, you know, this exact sequence at the bottom actually holds over Z. So do we have any hope that this is actually a set of Z isomorphisms? The answer is no, but it's not very far off. So actually this, uh, this KQ, uh, there's a failure of isomorphism in between the integral part of this and the integral part of that, but that failure is restricted to H4. Uh, you can get rid of the H4 by doing the following thing. So if you restrict to Neron Severi, 
what do you get? You get uh, zero goes to, then everything becomes exact over Z. Um, well, I'm going to write this and it might make Matt angry. We'll now over Z goes to GRW2, H2 lim, BZ goes to zero. And this is something which, you know, this limiting its host structure is something which you can really identify if you've got a degenerating family of K3s. This is something you can you can work out lattice theoretically, right? This is a, this is a lattice you can calculate. So here we've actually uh, here we've actually yeah. So maybe uh, yeah, we'll figure it out. So you know here we've got an actual sort of proper uh, recognized exact sequence of lattices. Okay, so so far what have I done? I've done some complicated algebra. Uh, well, not so complicated. I mean, it's linear algebra. Right? I've done some. I've done some, you know, fiddly linear algebra to define these pseudo lattices, and then I've derived using them some results about degenerations of K three surfaces that have been known since before I was born. Uh, big deal. So, you know, what's kind of the point of this, and where is it going? Uh, the point of this and where it's going is that. I can make statements about what the mirrors for all this stuff should be. And that's what's coming. That's sort of the next bit when I have watered the board. So this whole picture shows up in a second way. Um, Elliptic vibrations. So let's suppose I've got pi from y to p1. This is a elliptically fibered K3 surface. Uh, I'm going to let f f be a fiber. And I'm not, when I say elliptically fibered K3 surface, I'm specifically not going to assume there has to be a section here. Uh, you know, I'm just going to say we've got something like this. Uh, I'm going to have gamma living in P1. This is a loop. And using it, I can decompose P1 into a pair of disks or, you know, things topologically equivalent to disks glued along the curve delta, uh, glued along the curve gamma, sorry. And I'm going to let pi i from y i to delta i. These are just the restrictions of this vibration to each of these two disks. Uh, let's freshen up the chalk. Now I can define a, uh, so I can look at the second relative homology of these things yi relative to a fiber. Uh, if I've chosen my fiber appropriately to be on the curve gamma, uh, there is a bilinear form on here. So this has a bilinear form. It's called the cipher pairing. And with this, this gives it a pseudo lattice structure. And I can get a spherical homomorphism. What's the spherical homomorphism? I can take the boundary map from this to the first integral homology of an elliptic curve. And this, you can give it symplectic basis. It's got a symplectic intersection form. So this thing is a pseudo lattice. And as a pseudo lattice, it's equivalent to the, uh, you know, it's the same pseudo lattice as the numerical growth and deep group on the derived category of bounded coherent sheaves on an elliptic curve. So this thing is isomorphic as a pseudo lattice to what we've been calling E before. It's the same thing. And that's really a manifestation of homological mirror symmetry for elliptic curves. It's just saying that, you know, the uh, this is sort of the symplectic Fukaya category statement. I mean, well, OK, this is numerical growth and deep group of the Fukaya, you know, appropriate set of adjectives Fukaya category for elliptic curves. And on the other side, you've got the bounded derived category. They're the same thing. OK, so you've got that thing. I'm going to make two assumptions on the loop gamma. So I'm going to make two assumptions. I'm going to assume there exists a symplectic basis, uh, AB for E, 
such that uh, anti-clockwise monodromy around gamma acts as, and when I say anti-clockwise monodromy, I mean for either of the disks. I look at each disk, and this should be true for each of the two disks. It acts as follows. Uh, if this is A and B, A and B, uh, I should get one, one, zero, and the number up here should be E of YI minus 12. What's E of YI? E of YI is the top uh, topological Euler number, which you can compute for these vibrations over disks by just counting up the contributions from each of the singular fibers living inside each disk. Uh, the second condition is um, if R is the right adjoint, uh, so phi, phi i, the ri, uh, then ri of a is primitive. We think this second condition might not be necessary. We don't know any examples where it fails, but in order to prove the things that come afterwards, we need to know this to be true. And it's still a work in progress, so I'm allowed to make assumptions that I might get rid of later. Uh, under these two assumptions, these two maps phi i, these are then quasi del pezzo uh, homomorphisms of pseudo axes. So I'm in the setup I had before. I've got two quasi del pezzo homomorphisms of pseudo lattices. And so using the stuff I was doing before, I can glue them together. Uh, so if I glue them together, what do I get? I was doing all right for time, actually. I was a bit worried. This was a one hour talk. And uh, in the half hour before, I, before now, I have cut 20 minutes out of it. So you may notice that there are 20 minutes of this talk missing and they've been excised from the middle and that's why none of it makes any bloody sense. Uh, if you want the other 20 minutes, find me a beer in the pub later. Yep. <laughs> I'm completely agnostic. We're in Germany. There is no bad beer here. And if you think there is, you haven't been somewhere that's got really bad beer. <laughs> OK, so I can again take this direct sum. This is now the direct sum of these. Uh, direct sum over i of these two things. What do I get for k this time? k works out to be the compactly supported second cohomology of uh, y with f taken out over z quotiented by the class of a fiber. So this is what my, my thing k works out to be. Uh, m works out to be the orthogonal complement of f quotiented by ZF. So both of these, both, well, M, this orthogonal complement is taken in H2 of a uh, of the K3 surface. So this is this is sort of a subset of H2 of Y integral second cohomology of Y. Y cohomology, yeah, cohomology, right. Make sure I'm on the right place. And what does our exact sequence become? And this is exact over Z, not exact over Q. Uh, M, is the other thing right, goes to zero. And this is zero goes to the cohomology of F, goes to uh, compactly supported cohomology of Y less F over Z, quotiented by ZF. Oh, I've made a hash of this, haven't I? Uh, and this goes to F per over ZF. This goes to zero. That's an isomorphism. That's an isomorphism. That's an isomorphism. And moreover, you know, this is not just an isomorphism of Z modules. This is an isomorphism of lattices, where this thing gets the usual lattice structure from H2 of Y. Right. So I can induce a lattice structure on this from H2 of Y. And uh, this thing is getting its lattice structure off of these pseudo lattices. So what have I done? I've sort of identified this picture 
And what is this sequence? This maybe doesn't look terribly familiar. This is what Chuck and I, uh, in a paper last year, called the mirror Clement Schmidt sequence. Uh, when I say last year, I really mean two years ago. Uh, so you might ask, you know, okay, but on the other side, really the interesting information was contained in the neuron severity part, right? I mean, you know, if you take the neuron severity part, it cuts off the H0 and the H4, and then what you're left with is sort of a standard exact sequence that we recognize for type 2 degenerations of K3 surfaces. If you do the same thing on this side, I mean, you can do it. You can take these neuron severity lattices, but what the picture you get is not does not seem to have an obvious geometric interpretation, right? You get some sort of you know complicated sub lattices of these things, but you know we don't. There's not some nice clean way that we could think of to write these down as you know nice cohomologies. Um, so there is, you know, this sort of we take this as kind of an indication that you know working on the neuron severities. If you want to do mirror symmetry, is a little bit of a red herring because the neuron severities don't work so much don't, don't work so well over here. Really, if you want to do sort of some lattice theory here, uh, you've got to be working with the pseudo lattices. Okay, so I've said mirror symmetry a lot. So in the last closing minutes, let's say something about mirror symmetry. So what's the sort of motivation behind all of this and where we're going to? Uh, this conjecture was never really written down, but you know, sort of comes out of a circle of ideas by uh, Chuck and Andrew and me. Uh, so in this sort of situation, it says something along the lines of if X and X prime are a mirror pair of K3s, then we should have a mirror correspondence between type two degenerations of X being mirror to, let's say elliptic vibrations on what? Elliptic vibrations on X check. Uh, now, if I've got a type two degeneration, these are not necessarily unique. If I go to a type two degeneration, you know, there might be multiple different models for the same degeneration, multiple ways of completing the family. So we have something like uh, projective Kulikov models should correspond to uh, these splittings of P1. So taking a projective, yes. Okay, I, I, I don't know. <laughs> that, that, it, it, yeah, I, I don't, I, uh, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. So uh, it's not that's not something we really need to do, but maybe we can chat about that one because maybe you know something right. Uh, okay, projective Kulikov models should correspond to splittings of P1, and moreover, if you take these splittings of P1 and cut them apart, uh, the components of the generation here should correspond to uh, LG models. So you can think of an LG model as like an elliptic vibration over a disk or more generally elliptic vibration over an A1. So the components here are rational surfaces. You know, in nice situations, they'll be del pezzo surfaces. Those are mirror to LG models. LG models you can think of as sort of elliptic vibration-y kind of thing. Um, but the point is that like, you know, the, the pseudo lattice picture that I very hastily presented is the same on both sides. So over here, we've got these pseudo lattices G1 and G2. On the other side, we've got the same two pseudo lattices. You know, these correspond in this picture. So what we're hoping to do is we're hoping now, well, okay, all of this is uh, kind of the ambient space to work in, right? So, you know, when you're doing uh, mirror symmetry with K3 surfaces, you're talking about, you know, lattices and these sort of, you know, orthogonal complements of lattices happening inside, uh, yeah, you, you talk about, you know, lattice polarizations, orthogonal complement lattice polarization. We're hoping that using this, we can lift that whole theory from lattice polarizations on X and X check to pseudo lattice polarizations on the type two degenerations or the elliptic vibrations. So the whole picture will be compact. So that's where it's going. Okay, thank you very much.
Well, thank you. So we have time for questions, for comments, for discussion. Yes. Yeah, I'm just having a general questions. Just out of curiosity, do you do you know kind of the string theory literature in this direction? Because this is something which has been studied uh, uh, quite as extensively, where these type two degenerations are like stable degeneration limits, and then you you have a dual heterotic model where you have two. I, I know and so. little bits of this, but probably not as much as I should. Uh, and I don't know what the necessarily what the uh, interpretation of the super is. You know, uh, yeah, I don't. Probably. I know. I mean, most of the things. So the challenge here, you know, there's a lot of things I didn't get into, and sort of the challenge here is um, understanding the structure of the pseudo lattices. So the challenge of what we've done here so far is. Uh, understanding the pseudo lattice structure on these, where these YIs, the fibers are not necessarily all I want. So the fibers don't necessarily satisfy this thing where they're like like simple simple pinch tori. Uh, and I haven't. That's something that I haven't really seen much in the literature anywhere. Is you know, in most cases, people seem to you know in sort of. You know, a lot of the literature people seem to consider vibrations where they say, okay, you know, we assume that all of our singular fibers are, you know, like simple more singularities, and then we do some perfect geometry kind of style stuff. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I've, I've seen, I mean, actually now, I mean, there is some stuff here because the... Uh, well, do you, oh, want, you want to mention the string junctions motivation that you and... Yeah, Andrew yeah, yeah. So we started off with this with... Um, we started off looking at string junctions and there's the, the junction pairing in the string theory literature. Uh, and the junction pairing works out to be precisely the symmetrization or, or it's either the symmetrization or the anti-symmetrization of uh the pairings that we've been looking at. so this there there is a relationship there yeah so and um i'm now trying to uh we ran into some problems with that but it was about eight years ago and so i've forgotten what the problem was <laughs> yeah i mean we have there, there have been sort of um there have been relationships that we've observed here. So, you know, there's sort of some old work by, uh, well, when I say old, like 10 year old or so work by sort of Grassy and Halverson and Shainerson, where they study these kinds of vibrations and they get, um, and also like um, the Wolf and Zweibach. Uh, and they get these kinds of decompositions and we show that the same decompositions hold on the pseudo lattice level which is sort of, you know, you can deduce their results from ours, but the other way, as best I know, doesn't hold. Because we've, we've got, you know, they've, they've got these sort of symmetrized pairings and ours have got this, this non-symmetry, which makes them more. But I guess ours is, our picture is more natural from a uh, homological mirror symmetry standpoint. Because this is all kind of, you know, pairings on numerical growth and degroups groups of, you know, derived categories of coherent sheaves or Fakaya categories, depending on which side you're on. Uh, but but if you if you do want to see a tie into the heterotic type two and F theory, um, most of my, my postdoc is going to be talking about that in his his lecture. Yeah, we're turning it around using this to inform the other dualities. Yes. And I in this situation, when you don't have maximally unipotent monodromy, is there any version of SYZ mirror symmetry conjecture or anything like that? I'm not sure. Um, I mean, there is some maximally unipotent degeneracy hiding here. Okay. Uh, and the place that it's hiding is that, you know, there, there's some technical assumptions on your type two degeneration has to be, has to occur along a locus which is incident to a to point of type three 
like maximal degeneracy. Uh, so you can, I mean, the idea is to try and sort of interpret, make some mirror symmetry interpretation statements, which work sort of away from, you know, allow you to move away from the smooth loops to talk about the singular things. There is some SYZ related stuff here because ultimately, I mean, you know, we've got elliptic vibrations on K3 here. So, I mean, these, these are to some extent an SYZ type uh, object. And um, I, I think the predictions of SYZ effectively boil down to kind of, I, I think there's some statements you can deduce from SYZ, which give you kind of um, some mirror symmetry between these two uh, exact sequences that I've got. But we're, we're hoping to go further and do something really with the lattice polarization, and that's sort of where this is heading. But I'm not sure SYZ has a lot to say in that circumstance. But yeah, you, you, can, you can to some extent see this as a duality between, I think if you're looking at sort of generic K3 surfaces with a sort of generic type of degeneration, you can see this is some sort of duality between, you know, like a symplectic vibration and an algebraic vibration. I don't see any more questions. Oh, you're yeah, going. You okay? Fine, thank you. I was going to check it, but I won't now. <laughs> you're done. That was it. Okay, thank you. So let's thank uh, our speaker one more time. Thank you. Many of the two to set the video and to start.